Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm Jen Shanger from the New Jersey Autism Center of Excellence, the NJ ACE, which is uh, funded in part by the New Jersey Governor's Council and the New Jersey Department of Health. Um, we are very excited to have Alfie Cohn back with us today. Um, Alfie is the author of 14 books on education, parenting, and human behavior, including Punished by Rewards, The Schools Our Children Deserve, Unconditional Parenting, and The Myth of the Spoiled Child. He's appeared twice on Oprah, as well as many other TV and radio programs. His hundreds of articles published in periodicals such as the New York Times, The Atlantic, Parents, and the Review of Educational Research include Five Reasons to Stop Saying Good Job, It's Not About Behavior, and Why Self-Discipline is Overrated. Mr. Cohn works with educators, parents, and therapists across the U.S. and abroad and speaks regularly at national conferences. You can find more of his work at www.alfiecohn.org. Welcome, Alfie. Then we also have our lovely Dr. Elizabeth Torres, our computational neuroscientist who works on theoretical and empirical aspects of sensory motor integration and human cognition. She graduated from mathematics and computer science at UCSD. There she completed graduate work with a focus on applied mathematics to neuromotor control models in the field of cognitive science. She joined the Rutgers Psychology Faculty, the Rutgers Center for Cognitive Science, and the Center for Computational Biomedicine Imaging and Modeling of the Computer Science Department, where she initiated the path of interdisciplinary collaboration and attained tenure, where she also serves as our, our director of the New Jersey Autism Center of Excellence. Um, I wanted to remind everyone, um, we of course would love to get to questions today. Um, I, won't promise that we can get to all of them, but we'll get to as many as we can. Uh, you do need to be logged into your YouTube account. Um, and um, please feel free to tell us more about yourself because we love to hear about you as well. So um, first of all, it's very exciting to have both of you in one Zoom room. Um, and today we'll cover research on neural development, motivation and learning and examining the dominant behavioral paradigm, which is used broadly in classrooms and homes across the country, but especially concentrated levels with autistic and neurodivergent people. So at its core, everything that we will be discussing today is an issue of human rights. Um, and both of you bring a wealth of knowledge from outside of the autism field. And something that you've both urge, urged is the need for integrating scientific research, ethics, and knowledge from outside of autism or narrowly defined behavioral research into what we do with children who become adults, uh, as well as the lack of acknowledgement or tracking of potential harms and the lack of acceptance of feedback from those who experience the interventions and approaches. So on top of that, a lot of times there's also a lack of choice or access to services, which is worsened in communities with multiple or uh, marginalization, such as race, income, education status. Um, and that's another, a whole other topic that we'll explore um, at another time. Um, but first, Alfie, uh, you're known for giving talks that as you have said, may leave some residue the next day. And I wanted to start out again by reading a couple of quotes and then have you both discuss and then we'll sort of continue like that. So the first was from Rudy Riggin, who's an autistic style, a scholar that we had on previously. And she said, behavior as communication is a little bit slippery as a concept because it can be a way to elide the fact that people have a perspective. Behaviors don't communicate, people do. Everything observable might be information, but not everything we observe is intended as communication. To put this another way, Nothing I have ever done was ever intended to communicate. Please follow me around with a clipboard, making a lot of intrusive check marks, documenting everything I do that you think might be relevant to modifying my behavior in some way. But to hear people who say behavior is communication, you would think that a lot of people with disabilities are asking for that constantly, and I really don't think that's true. Um, the other quote I wanted to read, and then uh, I'll let you both, uh, start talking finally, <laughs> is um, 
from um, a paper called Autonomously Autistic Exposing the Locus of Autistic Pathology. It's by an autistic researcher named Rua Williams. I've quoted this uh, in one other webinar, but I think it's such an important perspective. Um, so they say, the locus of pathology exists not in the autistic person, but in the interaction between a hostile environment and the subjugated autistic. It is essential for parents, practitioners, educators, and autistic people themselves to ask the crucial question, is the autistic a machine or an organism? Are we active agents in our own embodied experience or are we a locus of behavior? It is not with defiance, but autonomy that I declare as an autistic person, I am not a manifestation of stimuli and response. I am agential, I am autonomously autistic. So um, I guess, Alfie, if we, we could start with you, um, if you could give us a refresher on the general behavioral management paradigm that dominates our schools here in the US and many other countries. Um, and then if you both want to discuss how that applies to autistic people more directly. Uh, well, the, the two quotes you read uh, anticipate much of what I would say because they nicely capture disturbing elements of the dominant behaviorist paradigm, which at its core says that there's no core, <laughs> that there's only surface, there's only the behaviors that can be observed and measured, and that's key, reducing things to numerical terms. There's no there there in terms of experience. That was the hardcore orthodox view of B.F. Skinner and it remains at this point in the 21st century, kind of uh, curiously on the one hand, a uh, historical remnant of old style thinking about human psychology that's no longer dominant in the thinking of um, most people who address themselves to, to human life. But on the other hand, remains remarkably disproportionately ahistorically influential in popular culture, including what real therapists and teachers and parents do. So serious thinkers no longer see much value to this idea and the predictive hypotheses it's given rise to um, and for good reason, because it, it never made much sense. It, it was a, a skewed, warped, superficial, odd view to compress human life into just measurable behaviors and to be tied to the idea of a control paradigm where people with more power could concoct some kind of reinforcement protocol uh, to get whatever behaviors they wanted. Um, and yet, a lot of people don't stop to think about the limits of this, about how there's more to us than behaviors, about how rewards are just as much about control as punishment, and so on. So the idea of, of agency, of the idea that there is a self here whose needs and motives and values are at the core of and underlie and inform the behaviors is still something that a lot of people don't think about, which is why you hear the word behavior tossed around so much in faculty meetings and in books for parents about disciplining their children and so on. So to understand the specific problems with, with ABA or, or, or PBIS or other uh, behaviorist uh, uh, approaches that are used in real world environments, you have to see the kind of intellectual bankruptcy of the behaviorism that gave rise to them historically and continues to animate them to this day. And I think those two quotations um, are a nice job at seeing that. Part of what behaviorism says, by the way, in addition to the fact that it's all about the behavior, that's where it gets its name, is uh, also the idea that behaviors can be chopped into little bitty pieces and that you can feed them on some sort of deliberate schedule with reinforcements, you know, goodies after each one uh, to get people 
to extinguish the behaviors the powerful person doesn't like and reinforce the behaviors that the person does like. So at its core, it is almost a kind of religious faith in a very truncated and disturbing view of human life that also equates us to other organisms um, that pretends to be real science and sometimes puffs itself up with a kind of arrogance claiming we are the only evidence-based or science-based approach, especially with, a, with ABA, which turns out to be the very opposite. Behaviorists are more like Scientologists than like scientists. Unfortunately, that word hasn't gotten out. Let's go yeah. ahead. Yeah, so I, I like to add to that, um, that, so I study behavior as well, but I do it from a completely different uh, approach. Uh, one that has uh, followed the various revolutions that have happened since the 50s when behaviorism came about and uh, flourished as we know it today. And, and it never changed much at all. And so this notion that uh, what you observe uh, unambiguously happening is, is what uh, describes or embodies what the person, who the person is or uh, what it does or what it's about to do um, is very limited because it's, it's limited in many ways. One of them is by the limits of the naked eye. We just don't have the capacity to observe everything that is happening. And the stuff that is not being observed or described is actually the important one. Uh, and we know that uh, now because uh, it's, it's quantifiable through the continuous streams of wearable sensors that uh, have revolutionized the way that we do uh, behavior in neuroscience or any other type of behavior analysis that is not a numbers that you take by hand. And this is a fundamental difference between uh, the science that my field does, which also involves behavior analysis, but is digital and is continuous. Uh, and the science that is claimed by a group of individuals who build a very fancy rhetoric to convince everybody else, but who actually are counting by hand. It's just counting with your fingers what you think you saw. So it's an opinion. And that is the fundamental departure from a scientific method. It's not based on opinion. It's based on objective physical measurements that don't depend on what you think. You may think and have an opinion on what you thought you saw happening between two people or one person, et cetera. But that is completely independent of what actually happens when you physically quantify and beyond the limits of the naked eye, go inside the person's physiology and with instrumentation that captures this, much like a thermometer captures your temperature when you have a fever. It doesn't, I cannot have an opinion on your, on your temperature on that thermometer. I mean, I can have an opinion, but it's irrelevant. You have a fever and there is an infection going on. So that's the problem that we have, that um, in general, behaviorism was created in the 50s. And after that, science continued and renovated itself. And, and it's a completely different story today than what we had in the 50s. Uh, and we know it and, and it impacts the way we learn and the way we should be taught. And, the way that rewards are uh, occurring intrinsically and extrinsically and how we can, oh, you know, can leverage them to learn better, et cetera. And none of this has been incorporated into the uh, behaviorism paradigm. It's a paradigm that is outdated, highly archaic. It's just not in a, a pair with the science that is going on today. So there's a lot to parse out from that. Um, and maybe one place I'll start is like, so Alfie, in your last talk, um, you described a lot about rewards and consequences and extrinsic versus intrinsic motivation. And Liz, you talk about this, you know, very frequently as well. So um, when I was going back and, and rereading your work, Alfie, um, 
one of the things that you had said is that rewards are the enemy of exploration and rewards are a highly used, highly pushed um, intervention, you know, that is aimed at, you know, being positive and um, helping to support positive behavior. But could you talk a little bit more on that? And Liz, if you want to bring in the extrinsic and intrinsic, you know, neural developmental aspects as well. I don't care how motivated somebody is. I care how somebody is motivated. Intrinsic motivation refers to an interest in or commitment to a given action or project or value where it gives you joy, you find it meaningful, you do it for that reason. Extrinsic motivation means you do something in order to get a reward for it or avoid a punishment outside of or extrinsic to the task. What research has found over the last, and by, by the way, the hardcore behaviorists um, attempt to wipe out of existence the very idea of intrinsic motivation, claiming we just don't understand the, uh, the, um, ex the environmental contingencies that gave rise to it. Everything for them collapses into, we're all basically subject to reinforcers, which is, basically, as I say, an article of faith rather than a, a hypothesis could, could ever be proved true. But what the research shows is that extrinsic motivators, rewards, reinforcers, including praise, by the way, mm -hmm. are not only inferior to intrinsic motivation, less powerful, but tend to be corrosive of intrinsic motivation. Or if I may summarize you know, more than a hundred studies in a sentence, the more you reward somebody for doing something, the more that person tends to lose interest in whatever that person had to do to get the reward. So the research shows, for example, that children who are given grades uh, for doing well in school, thereby become less excited about learning, regardless of whether they get a good grade or a bad grade. Children, who are praised or rewarded for helping or being generous become more selfish because they come to see the helping now as just a means to the end of getting the goody. Adults who are given financial incentives for losing weight or quitting smoking tend to be less successful at doing those things because now they realize they're being controlled and they become less committed to whatever the goal was, quitting smoking, for example, as a direct result of getting a reward for doing it. Rewards and punishments are not opposites. They're two versions of what I call a doing to model, as opposed to a working with model. And so I'm not sure you need much more than that, you know, two or three minute summary of the different kinds of motivation to be stopped in your tracks if you had been talking about motivation as a single unitary phenomenon, where the question is, how do we motivate people to do X, which is the wrong question. The question is what kind of motivation and what are the toxic effects of relying on rewards or punishments, which we euphemistically prefer to call consequences, so we can feel better about making children feel bad. Um, what are the effects of doing that? So it's, and this is the most important point to get across. You can't fix these problems by doing different kinds of rewards or doing them on a different schedule or, other, or, or remarketing them by claiming they're trauma informed or some garbage like that, which is just about marketing. The problem deals with extrinsic inducements per se. Any kind of program or system that has behavior in its name, which is what the B and ABA stands for, is inherently going to be reductive, controlling, counterproductive, disrespectful, and in the long run, because of what we know about human psychology, is likely not to be very effective. 
That's why we can't just, uh, it's not just about these are obnoxious reward reinforcement protocols, or we're doing it too much, or we're doing it to kids who are too young. All of those things may be true, but the rock bottom problem is with any system or belief system that is uh, grounded in a behaviorist worldview, which is inherently failing to do justice to human beings. Yeah, and I want to go back to uh, when uh, we are in a neonatal stage and uh, how infants, very young infants, learned to own their actions and their consequences in a way that is not initially through error correction or goal directness. It's something completely different. And this persists throughout adulthood and uh, beyond. Uh, and it's, it is an exploratory way in which the infant doesn't have a goal in mind. And it's a fundamentally different mode of learning that the infant comes to own and self-discover. So before anybody prompts to a goal or gives the infant anything that needs to be accomplished so that you have an error to measure against, the infant has just this state of mind that says, if I do this, maybe this happens. What if I do this? There is no goal in there. And this is completely different from here's the goal. I will do this so that I measure the error of the consequence of why I, what I did against what I was supposed to do and correct. These are two fundamentally different ways of learning. And the exploratory one does not have a place in behaviorism at all, it does not exist. It, it's as if they started developing this model after a system completely mature and developed because that's where they get this, these animals. And we're talking humans. Humans are altricial mammals. They, they take a long time of maturation before they can walk, talk, interact uh, in a meaningful way and that period. In, in fact, the first three months of life, they have to build anti-gravity muscles and movements because they are out of the womb environment. They will live for a while in this uh, position, in this, in this kind of uh, um, sort of in, into itself, exploring, sensing, and building maps, sensory motor, somatic sensory motor maps, until they begin to uh, explore the world and get the limbs out there. And that's a transition that happens. And it's, there's no error there to be corrected for. There is no uh, consequence to be extrinsically reward that you, you can measure and so on. The baby just does it by mere exploration without any kind of goal, it's spontaneous. And that is spontaneous self-discovery of what the goal, the sensory goal may be. It's an initiation towards action ownership and the development of self. And when that is violated and, and in the way that is being violated with behaviorism, that organism, that nervous system is in danger of trauma, of uncertainty, of a stress, of anxiety. And that continuously being reinforced through the reinforcement that your uh, schedule that you have is violating the agency and the autonomy, the self-discovering property, natural property of the nervous system from beginning all the way throughout the end of life. And uh, this is our opinion. We have measured this in the brain, in the body. We know this for a fact. Yeah. So this is one way that scientific evidence has been left out of much of what we've been doing. And of course, you know, for some of that time, this information wasn't available. So, you know, people have tried to do their best with the information that they've had, but that still leaves us with the problem that we now have these systems and services that are completely inappropriate and, you know, dominate uh, any service available, every, you know, classroom, um, 
to the point where people really don't have a choice. Um, and talking about the perspective of science, I wanted to bring in one um, comment that we had, which is, um, because this is another piece of this, the question of who is observing is relevant as a neurodivergent person. Oh wait, where did it go? Okay, sorry. The question of who is observing is relevant. As a neurodivergent person, I often notice things about my clients that NT people miss, or I have a different interpretation of what we both see. And this does bring in the question again of observer bias and you know um, your, your own perceptions. Um, and one of the things that you talk a lot about, Alfie, is the child's experience. And um, to, to quote you from your unconditional parenting book, you say, how we feel about our kids isn't as important as how they experience those feelings and how they regard the way we treat them. So would you just talk a little more about the concept of the child's experience versus what our intentions may be, um, even if it's you know only positive as mm -hmm. is the major argument now that it's positive. Um, and then Liz, maybe you could talk a little about adult determined goals um, based on this model. Uh, the word positive, of course, by definition is something that's seen as commendable or desirable. So how could there be something wrong with positive reinforcement and so on? But that amounts to just sugar-coated control. If I control you by threatening to punish you, if you don't do what I want, it's pretty obvious what I'm doing, you know. But if I offer to give you a reward or praise you for doing what I want, it may not be as obvious that it is positive in one sense, but in the more important sense, it is not desirable and it's still control. But uh, let me sort of pull the camera back for a moment. So far, we've been speaking descriptively about what we know from research, for example, about the nature of and why behaviorism and the particular practical recommendations, therapies, treatment modalities, and so on that, that grow out of behaviorism uh, tend to be ineffective in the long run and even counterproductive. Those are all descriptive points, which you can adduce evidence to try to support, right? So one way that that applies to the question you just asked is, if you only look at what the adults are doing to the kids, or one step better than just looking at the behavior of what the adults are doing, is to look at why the adults are doing it. What are their motives? You know, you know, are they doing it just to manipulate the kids, or are they doing it for the best of purposes, and so on, with a clear heart? You won't get as clear an indicator of what's going to happen later as if you look at how it is experienced by the child to whom the stuff is being done. And there's a load of evidence on this that shows that if you want to predict to what's going to happen later on in a child's life, you can't just look at the behavior that's measurable, even you know, neurologically measurable. You have to look at the stuff that doesn't lend itself to quantification or that's not just about behavior. And you can't just look at the, uh, what, what was going on even in the minds of the person who was acting on the kid. You have to look at the kid. The child's experience is the best predictor of what's gonna happen later. So for example, some classroom research shows that if you wanna predict how well kids are gonna go do in school in a couple of years, you don't look at how well they did in school earlier or even why, what the teacher thinks. And you certainly don't look at standardized tests, which only predict to other standardized test scores. What you look at is why the child thinks that she's doing well or not doing well. What are the, what are the meanings and explanations that she had, uses to attribute to what's going on? So for example, if a child thinks I'm doing really successfully because I'm really smart, that bodes ill for what happens later, as opposed to because she thinks she's doing it because of the meaning that she found in what she's doing, the interest that she takes in it, the effort that she puts into it, and so on. And so that's empirically provable. 
that if you want to know how kids are going to fare in general, you have to look at how they experience what, what's being done to them. But there's another whole realm here that does not lend itself to research at all. Not neurobiological research, not social and developmental psychological research, and that's a matter of simple values. And here, I will take the position, and I hope others would join me, even though it can't be proved true or false, that it is profoundly disrespectful to any human being to ignore that human being's perceptions, goals, values, uh, and the way the world appears to that person. What meaning there is. And behaviorism, as exemplified in one of the most extreme versions of it, ABA, but also in various other ways that it, it manifests itself. Behaviorism is a repudiation, a, a almost willful dismissal of subjective experience, saying the way you experience what's going on doesn't count here. We know better about goals and methods and we'll use our pseudoscientific method to reinforce the behaviors we want. And that is just a slap in the face, regardless of whether you're neurotypical or atypical, regardless of whether you're two years old or 20 or 80. I think we need to construct any kind of practical intervention as well as way of understanding human psychology on beginning by valuing the way things appear to the people with whom we're interacting. Yeah, Liz, you're muted. <laughs> I think it's important to uh, emphasize that uh, sort of what we miss by not uh, actually uh, seeing what's happening uh, to the to the nervous system of the child, uh, whether it is in a group setting uh, or individually. Uh, a case in point is, uh, for example, the, the, the measurements that we did of the heart uh, rate variability and the temperature and the cortisol and saliva and so forth, as they were experiencing uh, just instructions and, and prompting and, and the kinds of things that uh, this, the, the, the children experience very often and how much that upset their nervous system to the extent that, uh, and how much the baseline of that nervous system was already upset. And this is something that we cannot observe. This is something that uh, we can only theorize about or provide some kind of subjective uh, opinion on what we think we're seeing. And so that is an important element to consider in all of this, because let's say that we have a collective, uh, a group uh, that collectively thinks something about a child in that group and bullies that child based on and justified on their own opinion. And they don't know um, that that child has a problem, a medical problem or a health issue or a or his, um, his heart is uh, in this array, his the body temperature is completely uh, out of whack and this child is experiencing the world very differently from the other children. That piece of information has a chance to change uh, the, the, uh, the views of at least one person in that group. And that all, that's all it takes for that person to have a disagreement with the rest and raise this point to begin thinking collectively in a, in a uh, kind of way about the, the, the problem, the situation at hand. So I think that it's important to have both the unmeasurable information that um, Elf is talking about uh, and, 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 and in a sense of morality and kindness and just basic uh, human, uh, basic, basic humanity that, that is being lost in all of this uh, behaviorist approach. Uh, but it's also important to have this element of uh, objectivity, of physical uh, measure inside that child's brain, inside that child's physiology to demonstrate to the other people. And this is very effective. I have found it to be very effective when I show uh, teachers or parents, look, this is a child 
that has the same signatures as a person with chronic pain at baseline. You need to understand that this is a child's heart in flight or fight mode constantly that is being bombarded with all these instructions and prompting. And it's being treated uh, with this respect because you're violating this basic piece of information that you could not possibly see visually. You could not, it, it just escapes your naked eye. It's beneath awareness. And so I think both elements are important. Um, having that collective notion of that shared space of morality, kindness, and the values that we have lost, that we have seen lost in many scenarios today uh, to the rhetoric and, and the you know, very uh, elaborate narrative that has been built around these and the actual physiology of that person and of that person uh, in regards to the rest of the group that should be su supporting that child. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's a couple questions that I want to ask, um, and they may be a little bit complex here, but um, so one says, this was for Alfie, how do we know how a child thinks about their experiences, especially if they are less verbal? And then someone else says, yes, give us practical solutions. This all sounds great, but when my kid doesn't cry or laugh or speak, I don't know how to know what his subjective experience is. Uh, well, that's certainly true. Let's be clear that ABA does not do anything to address that issue. The, the basic idea of treating children with respect doesn't change depending on who the child is or how the child communicates. It just becomes, it takes more effort. I mean, it's just like the basic prescription for what I think good teaching and learning looks like in a classroom, which is about making sense of ideas, not just memorizing facts, doing things collaboratively, not just alone, um, uh, being concerned about putting kids at the center with their questions, not just devising a curriculum outside that. All the good stuff is harder to do if, you have, if you're a teacher and you have too many kids or the classroom is too hot, but it doesn't change the basic prescription. And by analogy, the same thing is true here in terms of working with being better than doing too, uh, valuing children's sense of the world and their experience being more important than objectifying them. All of that makes sense. It's just that with kids who are being described by these questioners, we have to become better detectives and perhaps reach out to like-minded uh, consultants who can help us read those cues, understand those signals and so on. You know, there's um, the authors of, a, um, of an article that came out uh, last year, I guess it was in 2020, suggesting that ABA basically in any version of ABA violates the principles of justice and infringe on the autonomy of children. They, uh, they make a point that the pronouncement that autistic children, quote, need to learn to talk is really just a declaration that we will not listen to the perfectly good ways they already communicate, unquote. Now that may be a little harsh because it's up with some parents, they want to, they need help, yeah. right? But the, but the point is that there are those ways DIR floor time, for example, as I understand it, is an alternative to ABA grounded in relationship on the developmental needs of the kids themselves and on helping parents to make sense of kids who don't talk or, or don't talk in a way that we're, that we're accustomed to and can provide the kind of help to read those signals rather than trying to act on kids to, to make them do what in some cases they can't or at least that they can't do without undergoing a lot of trauma into being turned by being turned into someone they're not. So I'm not an expert in how you go about being better at reading that communication. There are those experts out there. I just know that that's the direction in what you wanna move and you can't use the difficulties in communication as a rationalization for this kind of dehumanizing, objectifying approach uh, to try to make kids communicate in the way we are more comfortable. 
Absolutely. It, it's so important to emphasize that part of uh, allowing, uh, just treating the child uh, with, uh, with respect, but also with patience, just allowing that time to uh, understand better the, the signs and, and, and the hints that the child's body language and uh, state uh, reveal. And there is research on these and there is there are ways to do this. But unfortunately, in the case of autism, there, there has been uh, an evolution in the diagnosis since 1946 and um, beyond, uh, where everything was mixed in the same uh, and broadened, the, the criteria was broadened so much that you have everything under the zone, under the exact, exact same label. And what you created then was a, what, what was created then was a pipeline of diagnosis to treatment with a one size fits all model for fundamentally different subtypes of individuals within a very broad spectrum. And so at one end of that tail, you have individuals that can communicate and may have some difficulties uh, with certain social situations, but communicate to a certain extent and can provide you with feedback on how they feel about their state of mind or the world around them. You have at the other end of the tail individuals that cannot communicate in, in verbally, but can communicate in a certain uh, body language and you can come to understand their needs. However, that part of the tail is being imposed on this other method that came out of, straight out of animal conditioning and techniques that were developed not for human development. They were right. developed for laboratory animals in an, in an attempt to try and quantify something about animal behavior that they could then study. That, that's dehumanizing the whole uh, developmental enterprise of the, of the child, of the baby, and then of the child. And, and then forgetting the developmental uh, time, the, the critical period of developmental time that a baby comes into the world and it doesn't speak. That baby manifests its, its uh, being in the world in different ways. And that's the way that we should go back and re-examine because there's plenty of research on it. And DIR floor time is one of those models that actually based off a lot of this uh, uh, research and a lot of this time period that is critical, a scaffolding the, the, the individual agency, the individual autonomy, and, and that is completely violated by behaviorism. However, having said so, I know of, a large number of people in, in ABA that have realized and necessarily in, in private practices have gone on to get certified in developmental models of various kinds and brought that back to their practices because they realized the need with this very broad uh, spectrum that has everything under the sun and that they call it autism. And so th these individuals are not only willing to go out of their way and learn about other, other techniques, but also to incorporate the, the 21st century science into it. Whereas the individuals that have guaranteed their coverage and their uh, practices and don't need to worry about these are still stuck in the 1950s with, technology, with um, techniques that have nothing to do with human development have nothing to do with human agency and that are actually harming the children that are being subject to these uh, archaic methods. So people should consider very seriously what has been done here in the name of science with the rhetoric that just was making some group of individuals a, a, a lot of money and turning this into an industry, a multi-billion dollar per year industry much like the uh, opioid crisis did, if you watch that 
um, recent documentary, Dopsic, you know, with the Sackler family and so forth. That is exactly what happened with, with uh, ABA and autism, exactly like that. You can like timeline it in such a way and with milestones that they accomplished in their rhetoric that uh, sideline the science, the true science altogether and, and sold people uh, on, on hope on, and on, and on uh, here, you can trust it because this is scientifically proven what is not. And it's doing a lot of harm to the children. So uh, watch out for those uh, rhetorics that, that have uh, really contaminated and legislated, made it into mandates so that they actually quantify and force people uh, into this. In New Jersey, for example, we have the registry, it's a mandate. And that came from find a child uh, mandate, find a child. So then you, you put it in a registry and you provide that information to the, the behavior. It's a pipeline uh, for uh, what where it's co come to be known as the uh, autism uh, uh, industry. It's, 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 it's just what it is. And in this uh, lack of desire or uh, uh, just, to, to, to stratify the spectrum into different subtypes that actually uh, can tailor um, therapies and, and support and bring support from other fields that, that treat these uh, neurological issues and so forth. So it has done such much damage across different generations to, to so many people um, in the name of this science that is not such. Uh, can I jump that, in with a couple? Of, sorry, I'd like to offer just a couple of quick responses to that, if I could. Uh, first of all, for those interested in the the unbelievably profitable business that is ABA now, I would recommend an article that appeared in the Nation magazine last April uh, by John Summers, S E M M E R S, yes. who talked about the financial dominance and political power of ABA to the point that it's become very attractive to equity firms because of how much money there is to be made off this. In a subsequent interview, Summers described behaviorists' paranoid style that deflects criticism reflexively insisting that whatever they do is science and everybody else is just emotional, which I think is very much on point. Uh, I also wanna point out though that individual practitioners of ABA who get some training beyond that in other fields, um, that's fine as far as it goes, but you can't scotch tape DIR floor time to ABA. Um, at some point, you can't bring it back any more than getting good vegan recipes is useful when you're still cooking with veal. You know, there, there has to be a fundamental departure here. ABA at its core, when it's done in the way that we're, they're told to do it, this is not just a matter of bad therapists who are don't, or there's a lack of fidelity to the model, which is the way, the, the way a lot of belief systems try to stave off criticisms is by saying, oh, those people just aren't doing it right, or they're not properly licensed or something like that. ABA by its very nature, when it's done the way it's supposed to be done, is problematic in all the prescriptive and descriptive ways that I wrote about in autism and behaviorism that many of us have talked about. The problem is with what is at the core of the belief system, not just some aspect. And the idea that you can say, oh, now featuring new and improved trauma-informed ABA is like, I don't know, a company that makes a room freshener that consists of ragweed and saying, but now it's you know, allergy informed, you know? I mean, it's ragweed. The problem is with what it is at the core. Um, but I, I wanna come back to the point about uh, infancy that you were getting at, Liz, which may be a better response to these individual questioners. And I'm still thinking about their question and their frustration with some of this. And I'll just tell you a very simple homey story uh, quickly about my son who as an infant, uh, hated when I, he would wake up from a nap, his diaper needed changing, and I would put him on the changing table and he would scream and he hated it. And I had to think about basically, he can't tell me, he's not verbal. 
He's not able to communicate in the way that, that you or I could to say, here's what I don't like about what you're doing. So I had to make a basic decision. Either I'm going to impose my will on him in a cleverer way, or I'm going to try to respond to what he's telling me non-verbally. So I did not basically take the attitude, you know, tough, you know, and, you know, yell at him or strap him down or basically say, you're just making it worse on yourself. It has to be done. Nor did I treat him like I was house training a puppy by offering, you know, what a baby finds attractive if he stays still. Basically, I just sat back and tried to read him. And I realized from his point of view, what I'm doing is what psychologists here call perspective taking, which is trying to imagine the perspective of the other person, which is what we basically have to do. That's one of the key responses to, but how do I, how do I have somebody communicate with me if he can't talk? And I realized that what he's telling me, not in words, is I'm still half asleep. I just woke up and already you're putting me on that place where you do things to my butt. You know, <laughs> I hate this. And so, yeah, he was smelly, but I tried waiting a little bit until he was more fully awake before changing his diaper and it worked. Mm -hmm. He was telling me not so soon, you know, and I could have done by trial and error some other possibilities, but I wasn't trying to reinforce his behavior. I was doing him the courtesy of trying to understand what he was non-verbally telling me and then responding to that. And when I waited 15 minutes for him to wake up, he was perfectly happy having his diaper changed. I'm not saying that analogy is gonna obviously work for all situations or all people, you know, I'm just saying it's a fundamental shift in how we think about communication and looking at babies or children or other adults as subjects as opposed to objects. No, absolutely. And I, I agree that there is a fundamental uh, piece missing in the behaviorist approach that no training on other approaches could uh, fill in. And it's a combination of um, this uh, exploratory mode that I mentioned before, uh, but more importantly of uh, the honesty that it, it takes to actually do something scientifically based um, and multidisciplinary. And you can see that because it's such a monolithic approach with such a, uh, um, a uniform uh, group of people uh, checking on themselves and patting the, themselves on the on the shoulder, in the in the uh, uh, re, in the literature that they publish, that is it's a very different approach to science than the rest of the community has, which is multidisciplinary, open, and it doesn't involve this. Uh, the, the peer review system is different. It doesn't involve this kind of conflicts of interest that we see in the, in the behaviorism literature. However, having said all of that, and I couldn't agree with you more, there is still a problem uh, that this is an army of individuals that went out of their way for whatever motivation, money, power, fame, whatever, to do something that fulfills a need, if a, a need uh, that and, and that army of people, of those army of people, if you have a percentage of them, even if it's a small, that is willing to retrain and, and reacquire knowledge and, uh, and, and fundamentally shift what they were told um, to actually change this for the better. We need, to under, we need to understand that phenomenon. We need to um, count on those people because they already have a, a, an experience that is valuable, whether, is, is, whether it comes from a negative uh, or uh, uh, archaic method or, and so forth, they already have an experience that we can begin to work with. Um, and change this whole paradigm, shift the paradigm. Behaviorism is not for humans, period. <laughs> That's it. But there will have to be a retraining of an army of people willing to do this. 
And what percentage of the existing army of people doing it will be willing to actually shift gears and go with this paradigm shifting that is so needed to actually be humane and kind and just have common sense and patience of the kind that you were describing in your uh, example. I think this is an important point that we will need to consider in the future for not only autism, but for all the uh, uh, neurodevelopmental issues that, that exist today uh, and that are, are more visible, perhaps because of diagnostic systems or uh, whatever, um, and, uh, and will require this, this kind of uh, uh, therapeutic uh, support, which should be, the word intervention should be even abolished altogether because it's just a disrespect to the human uh, person, you know, the person itself. So I think this is my, uh, my uh, response. I, I hope that more people come to the realization like those um, ABA providers have that, that, that there is something fundamentally missing and wrong with it uh, to actually go out of their way to, to better themselves and you know, be better therapists. Um, so that leads me to a good comment that we got, which is, um, in Alfie, in reference to what you were saying about the perspective taking, how crucial that is, and that, um, a lot of neurotypical parents may need to also consult with other autistic people, um, because that also is an important piece that is conveniently left out of, <laughs> you know, most things that are, that are done to autistic kids. Um, and I think also the, again, remembering that, um, this, this is at its heart, a social justice issue as well, because we're talking about a marginalized group of people who have had things done to them without their say, every service, every place, every, you know, everything that's done has been done for them without them. Um, and like Liz, when you were talking about the harms, I had I had made a note about this because the harms are something that um, more researchers are finally starting to look at and talk about. And um, we had Dr. Kristen Batema Butel on earlier this year, who um, you know discussed um, the unreported. I mean, the harms. It's not even considered that it's possible to have harms in autism intervention, let alone reported on. And um, there's actually, um, let me just see here what I have here. Um, the other point I wanted to make is that uh, you, and you sort of said this too, Liz, there's an implication that we have to intervene, that it has to be done at certain um, uh, concentrations and that inter intervention can only be helpful. And we know that that is not the case but that is kind of what parents are told. Um, and I just wanted to read, um, this is a quote from Michelle Dawson, who's an autistic researcher and um, Dr. Sue Watson. And it was in reference to Dr. Batema Butel's uh, recent work that she did on a um, review of ABA literature. And it says, failures in addressing harms have proliferated across autism research Batema Butel et al. suggest for reasons such as the embrace of low standards by journals and the omnipresence of unchecked conflicts of interest. Disregard of harms has in turn wrongly been interpreted as evidence of no harms with consequences rippling out to other areas like early detection and screening, distorting research and practice. Despite a large literature spanning decades, accumulated knowledge about potential or actual harms to autistics from interventions that may occupy many of their waking hours for years is negligible. The foundations for adequate systems or methods for monitoring harms beyond the scope of intervention studies are thus lacking. Indeed, conflicts of interest entangled with low standards in research and practice would undermine future efforts to accurately capture harms via routinely collected data Nothing justifies these multiple multiple failures on the part of autism researchers. So I know we're about done with time. So my question to both of you is, 
how can people who have to exist in these systems right now, because there's not a lot of alternatives. So while we wait for this change and while we're trying to get other services, what's both of your advice on mitigating harm to the greatest extent that we can? Well, I'd say it depends who we're talking to. Are we talking to parents of, of autistic yeah, let's, children? Let's, Are we talking to therapists, <laughs> teachers? I mean, it depends what variety of responses. I mean, whenever something bad is out there, you have to work in the short run to try to mitigate the harm, but never forget the most important part is the long term, which is organizing, mobilizing, educating people to change the system instead of treating it as if it's just like the weather, something you have to accommodate to. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think ABA or any kind of behaviorist based approach is salvageable. Uh, I don't think, I think you can sand off some of the rough edges, but I would never take my child to an ABA therapist. And I would make it clear why I wouldn't do that. And I would connect with networks of other um, autistics and parents of autistic children uh, to see what alternatives to this approach that are basically more about how can I help this child if the child indeed needs help rather than how can I change the child so I'm more comfortable with them, which is the driving impetus of ABA at its core. Um, how can I move from doing to to working with? So I would, this is a case where I would say most of our effort should be in looking for and helping if we can, if we're in a position to do so, to create alternatives to a fundamentally problematic approach rather than trying to add minor repairs or sweeten it in some way to make it a little less traumatic. Um, how you go about doing that depends on where you live, who your contacts are, what resources are available to you. But most of all, any decision we make about what to do in the meantime, before we've moved past what I think in our, uh, the, the, the people who come after us will look at as a fundamentally horrific period in our, in our collective uh, development and civilization. Um, I think most of our efforts should be not just in mitigating harm, but in looking for qualitative alternatives and never forgetting that the problems with this approach are because of what the approach is, not just because of the way it's being implemented and doing what we can to learn more, you know, because there may be aspects of all of this that are unsettling, even terrifying, disturbing, angering, to people who have been told this is the evidence-based approach, it's what you've got to do if you care about your kid. And to be to consider that there may be a problem with that is necessarily going to upset a lot of people because they've yeah. been lied to um, and misdirected. And so connect, organize, educate, and be willing to gulp and say, wow. Uh, I'm not gonna feel guilty necessarily for what I've been persuaded to do up till now. I'm gonna feel empowered to make sure we're doing something different starting tomorrow. I 100% I agree with everything you said. Um, th this requires a complete paradigm shift. Uh, I'm hoping that people who uh, practice it realized uh, the error and, and learn about it. They will have to be educated on the error, on the fundamental error that was made here. Uh, people who served as sales representatives, so to speak, uh, will need to also admit to what they did. And uh, parents who were lied to, uh, you know, will have to recognize that just because they made this error because they were lied to, other parents shouldn't be subject to the same uh, intervention. It's, it's inhumane. All the science uh, truly um, demonstrates how inhumane it is and how uh, traumatic. So I 100% agree with that. It has to be done away with 100%. We need to come up with a completely new paradigm, a paradigm shift. And on that note, I think that science uh, it's not perfect, but it has certain mechanisms in place that should be translated to these private practices and, uh, and research practices in behaviorism, which are not following the scientific method and are not following 
the type of rigor that we other researchers have to follow. And one of them is the institutional uh, review board committees that are multidisciplinary. And again, this is science is not perfect, but here's a way where I would not get away with any of the stuff that these people are getting away with. Any uh, experimental uh, project, any project in my lab has to go so much scrutiny, not only about conflict of interest, but about uh, every single uh, instruction that you're gonna give to a child, how the child is gonna agree to it. The, uh, the, it's just, I mean, there's a whole protocol there that has to be followed and it goes back and forth several times before it's approved. That when you have a scientific, and it, it's based on, uh, on the Helsinki Act and none of this is being used in private practices or in the school system, where is the IRB system? or the equivalent of it mm -hmm. for the school system is a mandate that has not been in compliance with the Helsinki Act. And, and people who are involved in, in the neurodiverse movements should go after this. This is an easy low hanging fruit that you guys can, I mean, those of you in the audience, it, it's very well documented. Researchers who are following the scientific method are following all of these directives, we could not publish in a peer review journal, multidisciplinary journal without an IRB. And most of the studies I have seen out there that have maybe four max of six individuals, which is totally bogus, statistically speaking, don't even have the basic IRB approval. They get away with other stuff. So Two things I want to summarize. One, I 100% agree this has this calls for a paradigm shift. This is inhumane. Stop it. And you need to figure out how to do this. And we can, uh, the science can actually um, help with this. Uh, and second, methodological, there are, methodologically speaking, there are things in place already that we can monitor uh, as outsiders with no skin in the game what's happening. And that's very important because anybody who tends to make a buck out of it will justify it. You need to have no skin in the game, okay? So those two points I, I wanna get clear, get across. Thank you so much. Um, I'll just add from my perspective, I agree with 100% with what both of you said. And I think the disability rights movement is really important and powerful. And that um, I, I want to just say, um, Matthew Jason Diver had made a, a good comment that I'll leave us off with, which is that um, acceptance is the only path forward. Acceptance plus accommodations will lead to real inclusion. Um, thank you both so much, Alfie. We're so happy that you came back to talk to us. It's been a pleasure. These are, you know, difficult conversations in some ways, because um, as Liz says, when you're a disruptor, you by definition disrupt things and, and innovation can bring a lot of discomfort to people. Um, but we appreciate everyone watching. Um, we will continue uh, on our part as NJAs to have these difficult conversations because this is how science and humanity move forward. Um, so thank you all again. Thank you, Alfie. Thank you, Liz. And I hope everyone has a great day. Thank you, Alfie. It was, it was great sharing the, this moment with you. Likewise. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye.